Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Everybody that's here, I'm wishing you a good morning. And those of you that are not here in the flesh but here in spirit, we're going to wish them a good morning too. It's been a busy week this week. A little change in the weather. I think uh, we can officially accept the fact that autumn might be here for a while. Uh, it might be here for a while. I don't know. Yesterday morning felt like or yesterday felt like winter time. So the guy said we got four seasons in Texas. You know, we got hot, hotter, really hot, and then summer. So, you know, it <laughs> kind of gives the, the winter a skip, a pass there. But uh, we're going to start this morning. As you see, my, my friend and our accompanist, Mark, is out today. So uh, he's actually traveling and had some uh, difficulties with his travel arrangements, but he's on his way back. He just can't get here within the allotted amount of time. Uh, he's been in West Texas over at the Big Bend area and the Davis Mountain Range, and that's, that's a beautiful place. We hunt over around Ozona, and it's, I know for a fact, it's five hours from Ozona to Dripping Springs, and that's if you cut through Harper and go back to Fredericksburg back that way. So it's a long road, and uh, just uh, be in prayer for his, for his safety coming back this way. We're going to start with, uh, Lord, I lift your name on high this morning. Again, welcome to Fitzhugh. 335 is the hymn we're going to start with this morning. So y'all bear with me. Sing loud. Cause I'm... Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I could hear you singing well. Had a slight, slight injury to one of my fingers this week during the work process. It wasn't bad, it wasn't bad. Anytime you work at a cabinet shop and you're working around sauce, people like, oh no, he cut his fingers off. No, it was just a sliver, just a splinter, but <laughs> it does matter. As much as it's hard to imagine, but it does matter, so. All right, if you'll turn with me to <clears throat> my next hymn, 512, I believe is my next one I have here. God will take care of you. 512, 512, God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath 
his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you through days of toil when heart doth fail. God will take care of you when dangers fierce your path assail. God will take care of you. moved up this way now. I like that though. That's a good thing. Amen. Traditionally in churches, Baptist church especially, you got to get there early to get a good back seat. That's just <laughs> where, that's where that generally works out. Man. Glad to see y'all up here, man. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Next one we're going to do, this will be our last one this morning. We were looking at a special. I'm unable actually to do it by myself without Mark here to, to work with us. But um, So anyway, we're going to sing this one. This will be our last hymn this morning. If you'd like to stand, I encourage you to do that. And uh, if that isn't love, 340. <clears throat> he left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny was the lonely. There to lay down his life for me If that isn't love The ocean is dry There are no stars in the sky And the sparrow can't fly If that isn't love in heaven's a there's no feeling like this if that isn't love <clears throat> even in death he remembered the thief hanging by his he spoke with love and compassion Then he took him to paradise If that isn't love The ocean is dry There are no stars in the sky And the spell fly if that isn't love then heaven's a myth there's no feeling like this if that isn't love you may be seated 
Brother Pastor, <clears throat> you have an extra few moments this morning. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Jenkins. I'll be your preacher again this morning. And I'd like to begin by saying how grateful I am that God sent Jesus to pay for my sin. I am so thankful that Jesus died for me. Because had he not done that, I'd be all dressed up with nowhere to go. I always like to begin the service by taking this out of Lowry's hand. I always like to begin the service. We are officially hooked up. Yes, ma'am. Some things are important. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It took me a long time to really fully understand that, but you and I have been in enough religious meetings in our lifetime to know that Jesus was not in attendance. We've all had that experience. You know, we're gathered together in his name, and where did he go? You know, some meetings are just boring. Some, pe- some meetings are tedious. Some meetings are role-playing. And, and, but, you know, the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, and that's what I always want. I can't, I have nothing to offer. What, what's the old expression? Just a, one beggar showing another beggar where there's bread. But he has everything to offer. He's life changing. He is soul stirring. And so the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So I, no matter where I go, what, if somebody asks me to say something. Uh, you know, growing up, you, 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 you want to say something profound. You want to say something spiritual. You want people to go like, whoa, that guy, now that, ooh, he's impressive. Well, that's the worst thing they can say about you. That's not my ambition. It's the testimony of Jesus that is the spirit of prophecy. And he died for me. And he filled my heart and my life and my soul and my spirit in a way that I had no idea could even happen. So I celebrate him. Now this morning, we're going to talk about waiting. So just wait. (laughs) Join me in prayer, would you please? Lord, we thank you for the word of God and the words of God, the inspiration of the spirit of God. Lord, we have so much to be grateful for. It's too much. We don't know how to articulate it adequately, so we'll just trust you to understand what is in our heart today. We ask you, Lord, to be here with us, just to be you. Come and be the Lord, the boss, the king. Guide our hearts and minds and thoughts as we open your words. We, we, we pray for the ability to interpret and understand and apply the words of God to our life right here, right now. So we ask for your presence and trust for your blessing and, and wait for all you want to do for us today. But we just, we have a need right now, Lord, that only you can fill. So we ask you to fill it because it seems to be your nature to be a blessing God. And that's what we look forward to today. We rest peacefully now in our hearts knowing that God is here and he's going to speak to me. So we'll, lay, we'll, we'll listen patiently. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So you're, you're probably familiar with that expression, waiting for the Lord. Waiting for the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. You know, Well, you know, we're praying about this. We're just waiting on the Lord. We grow up with that. We kind of understand what that means. We're waiting for him. And over and over in the Bible, we are admonished to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Consistently, we are taught that waiting on the Lord is a good thing. And it, pay, it, it pays benefits. and it, you know, Spiritual dividends and tangible dividends. It's all part of Christian maturity. Waiting on the Lord is all part of Christian wisdom. You know, be patient. Just wait on the Lord. I'm going to read several scriptures today. Some of them will be familiar to you. Some of them may be kind of a surprise, but the, the, the theme is going to remain about waiting on the Lord. The first reference is in Psalm 27. As, as you know, sometimes Psalm 27 is referred to as the 27th Psalm. Very good. I'm so glad you're picking up on that. Verse 14, Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord is how he begins that. All right. And I always have to stop and say, why? I'm still the junior high kid who raises his hands and you know, says, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Because God is never threatened by our questions. You know, sometimes as a teacher, we might get impatient, a little frustrated, or weren't you paying attention? Or I'll get to that later. 
wait on the Lord. Why? I mean, is God just slow? Is he like my mother-in-law? You know, no matter how, you'd have to start saying we're supposed to be there at 730 when actually we're supposed to be there at 8. But, you know, if you don't tell her 730, she's not going to be ready till 8 o'clock anyway. So is that the way God is? We always have to wait on him. He says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Now, admonishing someone about courage or instructing them about courage implies fear is involved. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. You see, waiting means we have to be told to wait because if we're not told to wait, we don't want to wait. Why do we not want to wait? Well, because we're a little bit fearful. I need to get there. I mean, I need to get this done. I mean, this needs to happen. I'm a little bit fearful. So he says, be of good courage. And he will strengthen your heart. So you wait on him. Be of good courage. Just trust him. And he will strengthen your heart. He will give you something you need. He will do something for you that you need. Something you cannot do for yourself. He will strengthen your heart. So he repeats himself in Psalm 27. He says, wait, comma, I say, comma, on the Lord. He begins by saying, wait on the Lord. He ends by saying, wait on the Lord. He's up to something. Something's going on here. I mean, even the Gaither vocal band have a song called, Good Things Just Take Time. Good things just take time. In other words, we know that, you know that. Let's all just remember that. Take time. Why? Good things just take time. It seems to me that waiting on the Lord should be easy. Why isn't it easy? I mean, so many things today emphasize speed, right? We put a premium on speed. Why, do, why not just tell people when you wait on the Lord, don't worry about it. He's never long. Don't worry about God. Just, just wait on him. He won't take long. He'll, he'll be, he's right around the corner. You know, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. You ever heard that before? Did you know that FedEx introduced that slogan in 1975 and within two years after introducing when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight, within two years their accounts, their market share tripled. Two years is all it took. FedEx is number one now. How come? Well, because when it absolutely positively has to be there right now. We put an emphasis on speed, 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 speed. Man, I'll sign me up. Let's go. I can, I can write this today. It's in your hand in five minutes. Good. Let's go. We are an impatient bunch. We don't like to wait. So we have to be admonished, told over and over again. So waiting on the Lord, it's a good thing. It's a necessary thing. We don't like it, but I think we'll agree, well, it is good. Now, the next question is, though, why? Again, why? Why are we even talking about this? Why should we wait? I mean, is God the Father incapable of a speedy delivery? Is he incapable? Why is waiting good? We've already mentioned in Psalm 27, verse 4, he'll strengthen your heart. You know, we need a little courage, and, and he'll reward that. He will strengthen your heart. But that's what I'm going to talk about today, waiting, waiting on the Lord, patience. From the beginning of our lives to the very end of our lives, that concept is always going to be important and it will never change we're not going to outgrow our impatience let me say that again we're not going to outgrow it we're not going to out mature it we'll always have to be reminded to wait lamentations right after jeremiah lamentations chapter 3 verse 25 here's a second reason first of all he'll strengthen your heart secondly he says the lord is good to those who wait for him well, do you want God to be good to you? Yes, we do. Well, he'll be good to you if you'll wait for him to the soul who seeks him. Now, listen to this. This is Lamentations 3, verse 26. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you hear that? It's good to hope and wait. That's God's point of view. It's good to, it's good to, to wait. Hope and wait. Isaiah, in his book. Chapter 30, verse 18. Reason number three why, should, why we should just wait. Just wait. Therefore, the Lord will wait. What? Well, you know, if he wouldn't wait, I wouldn't have to wait. Why does he want to wait? Somebody remind the Lord we're in a hurry down here. So why doesn't it say, therefore, the Lord will hurry up? That's what we want him to do. That's what we tell him to do. Lord, please hurry. But the Lord will wait that that for the purpose of, why wait? That he may be gracious to you. That implies a plan. The, the wait, beloved, the wait is a setup. If you're in, the, in a wait, a holding pattern right now about something in your life, I promise you it's a setup. 
He wants to be gracious to you. He enjoys being gracious. And he continues, Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore, since he is gracious, therefore he will be exalted. That, which means he may have mercy on you. He wants to be gracious unto you and he wants to have mercy on you because the Lord is a God of justice. We don't think of him that much as a God of justice. But he's a God of justice. God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So, what did we just read? We all know waiting is a part of life. It's never going to change. It's never going to stop. We're never going to outmature it. But we don't like it. We like speed. Lord, I've got a broken leg right now. I've got a broken heart right now. I've got a broken home right now. I've got a broken friend right now. I've got broken health right now. We've got places to go. We've got things to do. We've got people to see. But obviously God is up to something. He is making plans. He's putting things into place. He is organizing. And as we've seen, waiting on the Lord will result in what we've already read, which was strength. No reason to fear. God is being good to us. He uses the word gracious to us. And he's being merciful to us. And he just said something I had to go back and check out. Did you see that? He is a God of justice. I don't get it. Why would he say that? I mean, I believe he's a God of justice. But what's that got to do with waiting? That means we get impatient. We know that. Because we need him right now. We think the best possible answer, the best possible response, the best possible thing God can do is do something right now. So we fear because he's not doing it right now. But we're going through something. We're afraid. We say to God, God, this is not right. This is not fair. This is not just. People drop out of church all the time, drop out of Christian fellowship all the time because something bad, quote, bad happened in their family. We've all seen that. People just stop going. Well, God let me down. God did this. God did that. So it's not right. It's not fair. You know, if we felt like everything God did was right, good, and fair, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. Nobody would ever leave church. Nobody would ever leave fellowship. Nobody would ever leave anything because everything comes out like we want it to. God knows that. He knows what we go through. And he has the power, the ability, the ways to make things right. Justice balances the scales of all of our lives. And while we're waiting on God's justice, remember we always accuse him of injustice. You're taking too long. You're not doing it right. You're not sensitive to my needs. You don't know what I'm going through. I shouldn't have to experience pain. I don't deserve this. And while we're going through this and while we're waiting for his justice, he is also working in other areas in the lives of other people. That's just Christian maturity. We want it for ourselves. We just don't want it for anybody else. But God says, whoa, I got a pretty big pizza here I'm making. It's got a lot of ingredients. You're going to like it once you taste it, but you got to let me finish. And let me show you what I mean. God is always up to something. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to be in Job now. I'm making you jump around a lot, but it's going to be recorded for posterity because when the archaeologists dig this videotape up, you know, they're going to be super impressed. So the point is Job 35, verse 13. Job 35, verse 13. Surely God will not listen to empty talk. I mean, we don't like to listen to empty talk anyway. We do it just to be nice. But God will not listen to empty talk. Empty talk. Yes, like when we say something silly like, God let me down. When we say something stupid like, God disappointed me, or God didn't help me, or God didn't do things the way I think he ought to do things. That's silly talk. That's empty talk. He says, not only will God not listen to it, he will not regard it. You know, we get mad as a form of retaliation. God let me down. God didn't do this right. God wasn't thinking about me. God was, you know, off someplace. That's our retaliation, our revenge for not getting our way. And God won't even listen to it. In other words, he won't retaliate against our retaliation. He won't listen to empty talk. He won't regard it. Although you say you do not see him. Well, yeah, I say I don't see him because what's he doing? Nothing. God knows what I need. He's not doing anything. He just tells me to wait. Just wait. Just wait. Wait till you finish your dinner. Then you can have some cake. What's up with that? Although you say you do not see him, you say he's not doing anything. Really? Actually, yet justice is before him. And you must wait for him. Job's point is, 
Job wants us to know about God's justice. When we think we are mistreated in any way, God knows it. So he begins a work. And his goal for us is justice. And he begins by putting the pieces in place. So wait for him, Job says. He's about to handle it. Just wait. All right, waiting. Two classic verses. You'll know these. First one is Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Classic verse on waiting. Those that wait on the Lord have a lot to look forward to, Isaiah says. Remember, we've already said he strengthens you. He's good. He's gracious. He's merciful. He brings justice. But also he'll renew your strength. You know, having problems wears us out. It beats us down. It's sometimes it's just too much. But he's going to renew your strength. They will mount up with wings like, e like eagles. They'll re God will refresh you. We can reload. They'll run and not be weary. In other words, sometimes we say, you know what, I, preacher, I hear all your fancy words and everything, but I've I got to tell you, I'm just not up to it. Well, you know what, you'll run and not be weary. And you'll walk and not faint. That always puzzled me. But what do you do when the battle is over? Man, you strut your stuff. You will walk and not faint. Battle's over. He says, so that's all, all that is worth waiting for. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Another ver a verse I think you'll be uh, familiar with. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. You know, when the Bible tells me not to forget this one thing, I don't want to forget this one thing. Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, from the Lord's point of view, from the Lord's ways, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. You know, God's not concerned about time, is he? I mean, it's, now, it, to him, it's all about timing. But it's man that created the concept of time, not God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You ever heard the term, oh, he's such a slacker? What does that mean? He's a goof off. But Peter says, Let's, let me remind you about God's point of view. Let me remind you, he is not slack concerning his promise. He knows what he has said. Everything I just read to you for the last 15 minutes, he knows what he has said. He's not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. He's not indifferent, he's not casual, he's not distracted, he's not disconnected, and he's not deaf. But on the contrary, Peter says, he's long-suffering. He's patient toward us. Not willing that any, anybody should perish. I, I have people in my past that I really don't know whatever happened to them, and frankly, I'm not convinced that I care But that's just me. God would never say that. There's some people in my past that I care deeply about. And some sort of a little bit about. But i got to tell you, some of them, I don't know where they are, whatever happened to them, and it's okay. God is not that way. He's not willing that any should perish. We all get His undivided attention. We all get His undivided attention. None of us will ever be able to accuse God of being in too much of a hurry. None of us will be, ever be to say to God, Lord, you just didn't give me enough time. The Father has plenty of time. Peter continues, but that all should come to repentance. He wants the same thing for everybody. So he gives us time to think about it, and it takes time for people to repent, and it takes time for people to change. And he may be working on someone that you know in your life, somebody going through something right now while you're waiting Because he's always busy. He always is. Notice immediately God's interest, God's concern, God's emotion is always about others. It's always about redemption. It's always about salvation. It's always about rescue. So he will do what he has to do no matter how long it takes. Because to, to God the Father, there's no such thing as too long to be a blessing to his children. No such thing. The moral of the story is don't ask for God's blessing if you don't want his timing. That's part of the package. Every moment we wait has a purpose. And no, he hasn't forgotten. 
Now, another verse I know you'll remember, Isaiah 64, 4. You've heard this before. For since the beginning of the world. Wow, what? What a way to start a sentence. For since the beginning of the world. Let's see, how long ago was that? I mean, ever since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceive, perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God besides you who acts for the one who waits for him. So you're not going to be the exception. You're not going to be the one who goes to his or her grave and saying, you know what, I was really praying that the Lord would come through for me, but... You know, some people, some people just, that don't make the cut. Some people just don't, don't, get, don't get that. Some people just, you know, God just sets them aside and, think, and thinks to himself, well, you know, in eternity we'll sort it all out. And, and don't worry, you just have to die now and your life's over and I'm sorry. No, no. No God except our God who acts for the one who waits for him. It's never happened. No exceptions. No God goes to work like our God goes to work. All we have to do is wait. Maybe a minute, an hour, a day. And we'll see a little bit of that in just a minute. But, but here's what we sometimes don't understand. Sometimes Jesus comes to the rescue of his disciples. Sometimes they're in a boat in the lake and they're thinking that we're going to die. And so they have to wake him up to get his attention and they don't die. So he rescues them. Sometimes people are on their deathbed. They even die. Jesus comes like Lazarus, raises him from the dead. But you know what? Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes people are on a boat in the lake in the storm <clears throat> and they don't make it. Some people get healed. And some people don't. They die, and they loved Jesus just as much. Yet we're still told to wait. Why? Why would he stick his neck out like that and say, well, just wait? Well, Lord, I'm at the funeral, and you're telling me to wait. We need to learn the principle, beloved. Learn it with me this morning. What God is doing in you is more important than what he wants to do with you. What he's doing in you is more important than what he wants to do with you. And what he's doing in you is more important than what he wants to do for you. What he's doing in you is more important than what he wants to do with you and for you. God the Father is aware of your skills, your talent, and your heart. And he's not going to waste them. He will refine them. But he's not going to waste them. It is so hard for a human being to understand that God, our Father, is not getting us ready for tomorrow. He's getting us ready for eternity. There's a difference. And eternity is coming. It's coming for every one of us. You will be there. And for the rest of your, my life and yours, I want you to notice to God, there's no such thing as idle time. We're all on a journey. We're all on a mission. We are all on on assignment and isn't it funny that in today's culture the higher your status in today's culture the shorter time you have to wait I mean if you're a big shot you just don't have to wait in line right I mean in, in our culture the higher your status the shorter time you have to wait for, for anything big shots get preferential treatment but in God's kingdom and in God's culture it's just the opposite I mean, the higher your status, the greater your importance, the longer you have to wait. Which brings up a final point. Waiting on God will change you. It'll change you. We've already mentioned, you know, the greater courage, the stronger heart, God's goodness, God's kindness. We usually ask God to change our circumstances. But the change he is seeking is, is, is a change in us. He's not working on the circumstances like he's working on us. We usually ask him to change all of that. You remember Saul of Tarsus? Acts chapter 9, he became a changed man, a different man. He became Paul the apostle. God blinded him and started asking him some questions. He stayed blind for three days. Imagine that. Total darkness. A man who could see perfectly all of a sudden can't see a thing for three days. Historically, Paul the Apostle became world's greatest, historically, but world's greatest missionary. Great man. But after that wait was over, Paul was a new man, totally new. He said things we never knew was inside of him, but they were always inside of him, but he wouldn't say them. But he started saying them after that three days of blindness. Who are you? I am Jesus whom you persecuted. He didn't ever say, 
Jesus, wonder who that is. He knew immediately what God wanted. But God was going to get it out of him. And he did. But he had to wait. God blinded him, set him aside, and said, Paul, just wait right here. I'm not finished. Or how about Abraham and Sarah? Remember that story? From, it started as far as back as Genesis chapter 12. God promised them a son in their old age, but they had to wait. They weren't ready. So God got them ready. But God wasn't just getting them ready for a family. God was getting them ready for a legacy. And in 24 years, their wait was over. But we still read about them today. I think in Luke chapter 2, the two old timers, you know, Anna and Simeon, going to the temple. Anna was married seven years and her husband died. The Bible says, but every day she went down to the temple to give thanks to God. And she was there when Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus. Her wait was only 64 years. But I want to ask you something. Was it worth the wait? What do you think she would say to that? The moral of the story, we don't like to wait. It's not our nature. But for the rest of our lives, when we think about the best things God will do, we'll always have to wait for them. We have to be patient. Now, why? Again, why? Two reasons. First of all, we're not ready. And he's not finished. You know, we're really not big enough to take in the blessings that God has for us. But they're coming. Just wait. Which leads me to reason number two, why we have to wait. First of all, he's not finished. The blessings are coming. But what God is doing in you, in you, is not easy. It's not simple. It's not normal. It's not ordinary. It's not superficial. It's not typical. And you and I would never think of it on our own. We have these primal prayers as human beings. We pray God to do certain things, whatever way you express it. But we know he's there and we know he's listening. We would never think of the goodness he's got for us on our own. Ephesians 3.20 says, And God is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. According to his power, not ours. According to his power that is within you. To him be glory in the church. According to his power, not ours. So today we're just going to say relax. We're just going to relax and let him finish. My prayer for you today is if there's something on your mind, on your heart, you say, you know, I'm kind of like a little nervous, worried, fearful, uptight, tied up in knots, impatient, whatever it might be. Just relax. Let him finish. Because we're still sitting here listening. And he is not finished. Lord, we thank you for this message. We ask you to bless it to our innermost man. Lord, whatever we need to know, we pray to have that reassurance that comes from hearing the words of God. I pray that for everyone here. We thank you for those times that we have waited and you have finished and we can look back and see what you have done, how quickly we forget what you have done. You have brought us to this point and we express our praise and our thanks right now for what you have done. And it just reemphasizes what you're going to do. We have so much to look forward to. We will have an eternity to enjoy it. Bless everyone who's here. And again, we thank you for the Lord Jesus who makes all things possible, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Johnny, how about the Lord's Supper? We're going to try to do that today. I think I've told you before, but I will remind you, the Lord's Supper was always something that was a challenge for me as a pastor. I had served the Lord's Supper, enjoyed the Lord's Supper. I've been in homes serving the Lord's Supper when I represented other churches. I'd seen it done. I'd heard it done. I'd read all the scriptures. The Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, the body and the blood, you know, the bread and the wine or the grape juice. And we've talked about why we use grape juice and not wine and so forth and so on. But the fruit of the vine, we talked about it. We're all kind of familiar, but it was in the sixth grade, I think it was, when I was at the lunch table. On a Monday noon, eating with David Jacobs and Michael Green and Bill Howard and Butch Farmer and all these guys. And, and you know, back then, this was in the 50s, we'd all been to church. You know, Butch was, daddy's was a preacher at the Assembly of God Church. And Greeny had, was over to Methodist Church and Ricky Pitts was over there and Bill and David were all at the Baptist Church. Anyway, they, they started this conversation about communion, about the Lord's Supper. And one of them said, yeah, we 
had communion yesterday. And all of a sudden, this little sixth grade conversation kind of came to a stop. You know, we realize we're trivial and the, talking about, the, about communion is, 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 is important. I'm, I, I'm clueless. I mean, I'm a spoiled rich kid. I don't know what you're talking about communion, but I thought if you're going to be serious, then I'd better be serious too so it looks like I know what you're talking about. So I can remember these emotions. The word communion hit the table, and all of a sudden the world just sort of stops. Communion, communion. And I looked over at David, and I said, what's communion? He said, the Lord's Supper. We Baptists call it the Lord's Supper. And Michael Green, he, he called it communion. But anyway, it's the same thing. And I said, oh, and, and for, the, for the Catholics, I believe, or maybe Episcopalians, they call it the Eucharist. It doesn't make any difference. We know what it is. But what the climax to me of the Lord's Supper was, my first church as a pastor was in El Dorado, Arkansas, six miles out in the country. And I knew my crowd was going to be about 50 or 60 people. And I, I, I'd seen the Lord's Supper done. I didn't think I was going to mess it up. I have to tell you something funny. That was in the day when James Robinson and pre preachers like him would just, would just pace the, the pulpit area, you know, they didn't even have a pulpit. They just paced. They're like panthers. The really great preachers, the powerful preachers, had a lapel microphone, and they could just, they could, man, I mean, it, they scared you to death. You shivered through the, the good news of the gospel because they were so powerful. And James was. I mean, he was, he was strong. And, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, to be an effective preacher, I need a lapel microphone. But back then they had a wire, a long wire, and he would whip that cord, and he'd walk over here, and he'd whip that cord, and he'd walk over there and whip that cord. I'm thinking, I've got to learn how to do that. I mean, I can never be a great preacher if I don't learn how to do that. Everybody knows that. So I said, church, you need to buy me a lapel microphone. And this is a church about, you know, about half the size of the one we're in right now. It was not a big church, and they didn't have a big budget. They would never even heard the word lapel microphone. But we're going to get one for little Johnny because he has to have, be a great preacher, so let's go out and buy this $50 lapel microphone. And so they did, and I tried to plug it in and everything and fix it up. Well, I'm ready. And so the first Sunday that was I was to use it was the same Sunday, it, it, quarterly. You know, we did every three months, serve the Lord's Supper. And so the, the deacons came forward, and they had the plates, and they had the cups and everything, and I've got this lapel microphone on, and they hand me the plates, a stack of them. I'm down on the floor like this. I got that lapel microphone, and there was a corner on the steps, like this corner right here. That wire caught on the corner, and I did this, and those crackers went everywhere. <laughs> what do I do now? Do I stop and pick them all up? I mean, literally, what I know what it was. We had done serving, so they're bringing them back to me. That's what a whoo! Lord did me a miracle then, because I don't know what I'd have done. But but they all kind of crowded around, and some of the ladies came. They began to pick it all up. So that effect that traumatized me. One of the things the Lord said, you know, after I sat in my office after the after the service, was, I mean, he didn't have to say anything. He could just be there, and I'd know what he was saying. <laughs> it's something like, are you happy now? Are you a great preacher now? But, but, but James would whip that cord around, and I thought, man, I'm going to whip that cord around, and look what it did for me. So I never use that again, for, ever, and not to mention the Lord's Supper. So you see, John, you know, a lot of people use wireless microphones now, but you're still this. Yeah, you go through what I went through and see what you're using. Yeah. That's, so that's, that, that, that's irrelevant. The point is, my first church service where I was responsible for administering the Lord's Supper, was it was a Saturday night before that Sunday, and I sat in my office, not unlike the office here, and I, and I didn't know, you know, I was never patted myself, on the, I wasn't raised in church, so I didn't know how you're supposed to pray. I just, what I learned was God changed my life miraculously, instantaneously, about two years before that, and so I just... Talk to him. I just talk to him. And I say, Lord, I have to serve the Lord's Supper tomorrow, and I know how it works, and I would go over the scriptures and uh, do this in remembrance of me. I said, Lord, but I, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know why. Why in the sixth grade will Michael Green make everything so solemn as sixth graders? Why, why is it important? What am I missing? I mean, every church does it, right? Every church has the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist or communion. Every church does it. Some denominations do it regularly. They do it every week. or I think Catholics, you can get it done every day. I, I'm not sure, but it's a big deal. And I said, Lord, but I don't get the big deal. I need you because he says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask it of me, and I'll tell you, if you'll sit still long enough and, you know, and stop being a sixth grader, I will talk to you. And I said, Lord, I need to know because I'm going to do this in the morning. And so he began to walk me through it. And so I'm going to kind of walk you through what he walked me through. But the first thing he taught me was this is the only thing I ever ask you to do for me. 
I mean, we try to do everything we can for the Lord. We're just doing it for the Lord. Let me help these people. I'm just doing it for the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying it against that. I'm just saying this, what we're about to do, is the only thing he ever asked us to do for him. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. This is how I want to be remembered. This is how I want to be remembered. We, we remember him as the great truth teller, as the prophet, as the miracle worker. We remember Jesus for many reasons. We try to even speculate what he looked like. He's that important to us. We build statues to him. But that's not what he asked for. He asked for this. Okay, I got that. Now you have to ask, why? Why did he ask for that? Do this in remembrance of me. Because, to, to, to shortcut is... He came for one reason. He only came to do one thing. The rest of it is just window dressing. He came to do one thing, one thing only, and that is to pay for my sin. He came to pay for my sin. He's the sin bearer. I've had people say, well, you know, there's many ways to get to heaven. I said, great, give me all of them. That's fine. I said, but I will tell you this. I always remind people because I don't want to preach at people who didn't invite my preaching. I will say this when they're comparing prophets. I'll say, yeah, they're all great, great guys, whether you're talking about I don't know, Buddha or Hare Krishna or Muhammad or whoever you want to talk about. I, they, 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 I'm not threatened by that. Let's have a good conversation. I, but I will remind them. But remember, Jesus is the sin bearer. He may, you can out talk him. You can out miracle him. You can out a lot of things. But he didn't come for that. He came to pay for my sin. And that's the one thing that separates me from the God who made me is what I've done against. I've chosen against him. I've conspired against God. And Jesus said, yeah, I know. That's why I came. I've come to rescue you. No other prophet or priest or big shot ever said that. That's why he says there's only one way. There's only one thing that separates us. And I'm going to take care of that. Just trust me. That's what it means to be saved. I trust God to save me. So I'm sitting in my office and God's just flooding my heart with all of this. And so now I can turn immediately to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and I'll say, you know, when you meet together to eat and I, I want to pass on to you what I received from the Lord. Paul is saying like I'm saying, let me tell you what he told me. That the same night in which he was betrayed, the worst night of his life, he wasn't thinking of himself. He was thinking of you. He took bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces and he said, this is my body. And you can see when we use things to demonstrate something, a visual aid. He, Jesus is breaking this bread. We have sliced bread, but he's breaking this bread. And he said, this is my body, which is given, broken for you. I'm doing this for you. You know, you're the one that deserves to be broken, but I'm doing this for you. Do this to remember me. Do this to remember me. In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant. I don't have the time, but I would take you back to where it all started in Exodus chapter 12, where the Lord sends the death angel and saying the death angel is coming for Egypt and for the Egyptians. But I'm going to save you. Just take the blood and put it on the doorpost. Where is the safety? Behind the blood. And Moses said, do not Go outside the blood. I can't promise your safety. But if you'll stay inside the blood, the death angel will do what? Pass over you. So what night is it that Jesus is talking to his disciples? It's Passover. They're celebrating Passover. He says it's a new covenant between God and his people. Why old and new? Jeremiah chapter 31 says, I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to do for you and here's what you're going to do for me. But in that first covenant, in Jeremiah 31, God does not take account that we could choose against him. He says, you'll do this and I'll do that. And they said, yeah, we'll, 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 Exodus chapter 12, we're going to be your people. It's not a problem. We've seen what you can do. You're, you're, you're the godfather. You're the sugar daddy. Man, we want to be on your team. But nowhere in the old covenant did God say, if you choose against me. Well, we chose against him. So this New Testament is an agreement confirmed with my blood, his blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing, you're retelling the story of the Lord's death until he comes. So that's what we do. We're just retelling the story. <clears throat> Gentlemen, if you get that bread, those wafers, those crackers, thank you, Johnny. 
He says, if you eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, you're guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Well, boy, that's a red flag to me. I don't want to be guilty of sinning while I'm taking the Lord's Supper. What does it mean? If you eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily, that word really used to hang me up, unworthily. I'm not worthy. I've sat with people before and I could hear them talking. Well, I'm not worthy. Well, that's his point. That's why you take it. The only thing that makes me worthy in the presence of Almighty God is when I realize I'm not worthy. I'm taking this because I'm not worthy. So don't eat it unworthily. Don't eat it like, hey, God, me and you are pals. Lord, I don't deserve what you're doing for me. But for 2,000 years, that's why people have praised the name of Jesus. is because he took the blame. He took the pain. He took the punishment so we would never have to. That's why you should examine yourself, he says. Examine yourself. Well, Lord, if I examine myself, I don't see the good stuff I've done. I remember the bad stuff I've done. And he says, that's the point. Let a man examine yourself, and then you realize you're not worthy. And then what? Throw it down and go home? Then you eat the bread and drink the cup. Because if you eat the, eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're drinking damnation to yourself. We're not here to honor us. We're not here so we can go to the dinner table tomorrow with David and Michael and Ricky and Bill and say, guess what we did? We're doing it because we, what, we, what we're trying to say is, guess what he did? So let's hold it up. Lord, we thank you for the broken body. Lord, I know when I face you in eternity, I will not be punished because you were punished for me. Thank you, Lord. Gentlemen, the cups. If we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by the Lord in any way. You know, in the Old Testament, beginning in, especially in Exodus chapter 12, but in many, many places, the Lord set up a payment system. If you sin, just bring what is the most valuable thing you have. And in their case, it was animals. It wasn't necessarily gold or silver. You could take that too, but usually people brought an animal. So God said, okay, here's what we're going to do. You know, if you, you bring your best, show me that I am important to you. Bring your best animal. We're going to kill that animal. We're going to shed his blood, put it on the altar. Your sins are paid for for another year. See you next year. So that's why Jesus is blood, because Jesus is God's best. He's his son, God in the flesh. Bring your best and sacrifice it on the altar. So we'll hold it up. Lord, we thank you for sacrificing your blood, the very best for us. And we take this in gratitude in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you for your participation. Gentlemen, thank you for your assistance. There's an old hymn that we used to sing, and I hadn't heard it in a long time, but I remember it. The Bible says when the disciples had finished this, they all sang a hymn and went out into the Mount of Olives. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Johnny? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you all for being here this morning. I come over here because this is where my notes are. So That's a great, great, great message. You know, the, the kids, a lot of times I'm, <clears throat> I'm reminded about these very things when they say, are we there yet? What's for supper? What did I get for Christmas? They, they always there is that impatience, right? Well, we're no, no, no different, really. Our Heavenly Father refers to us as children, too, and that's because we are a very un- patient and impatient people praise God he's continuing to work he works in us and he works through us and uh, our only abilities that he's impressed with is our availability that's a fact 
God bless you for being here this morning. A few announcements. Um, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, getting close to the end of it, so if you have not yet expressed your appreciation, please take this opportunity to do so. Also, this is a, a day of fasting, I think, for many. Um, I think Franklin Graham is encouraging that, a day of fasting and prayer. Certainly the prayer, uh, we can participate in all of that. Um, and we need that. Our nation needs that. We have a prayer meeting on the 28th. Uh, that will be at 6 p.m. Meal is at 5.30. That's Wednesday, October 31st. Ladies Devotional and Prayer Group meets at 9, Saturday. November 1st, Sunday in November, dinner on the ground. That's always a fun time right there. And uh, we got the time change coming real quick now. I think November 1st we do the fall back. I can never get that stuff straight. Stumble forward, fall down, get up, spring back. I, so I'm pretty sure we told our clocks back in the fall. There will be some, like me, probably, who inadvertently or in, invariably forget, and I'll be, you know, wow, am I an hour late? What's going on here? Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for being here. Uh, may he richly uh, bless you today. If you'll stand, um, we'll have a prayer of dismissal. Have I missed anything? Birthdays? Did I miss a birthday? No, okay, good. Thank you. Meeting, meeting tonight, that's right, and, and we will be here 6.30 for that, so Bible study time. If you'll pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we, we ask you to bless this, uh, this day, this time. Father, bless your people. We pray for our nation. We lift up our nation this time. Father, we pray that, that uh, your will would be completely and perfectly accomplished in all that we're facing. Father, we know that you are in control, and Lord, that things will happen according to your divine appointment. Let us be patient, Father. Let us wait. Uh, wait on you, Father. That's a difficult thing for us. But we know that's the proper thing, Father. We just need to be patient, trust, and abide in you. Keep our hope and our eyes focused on you, Father. You are the hope for all things and for all of our lives, for our future. We praise you and we bless you, Father. We lift each member here up, ask you to bless their families, Father. Lift up those that are uh, sick or unable to... Uh, to, to be here, Father, we just pray that you'd heal them if that be your will. Thank you again, Father. We, we love you. We pray that uh, you'll be with us this week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.